So um, welcome back, everyone. Uh, let me introduce to you uh, John Horton. Actually, it's a great, great pleasure. And uh, John has been mentioned uh, today during the conference a lot already, and also his works. So a couple of people have referred to him during uh, their presentations. And uh, so he's probably well known to most of the people um, at the conference, but uh, I will still introduce him. Um, John has received his uh, bachelor's degree in mathematics uh, from the United States Military Academy at West Point. And he has also obtained a PhD in uh, public policy from Harvard University. After completing his PhD and prior to joining NYU Stern uh, School of Business in 2013, he served for two years uh, as the staff economist at Odesk, uh, which is an online uh, labor market. So he really knows about the topic uh, in and out. And um, he is now the Richard uh, Leghorn uh, Career Development Professor and an Associate Professor of Information Technology at MIT Sloan School of Management. Uh, John's research focuses, as you probably all know, on the intersection of labor economics, market design, and information systems. So he is uh, very well suited as a keynote speaker for our conference here. He is uh, particularly interested in improving the efficiency and equity of matching markets, and he has published several times in uh, very prestigious journals, among others, Management Science, and uh, since he has been stationed in Germany, he probably knows a bit of German, so I would say that's uh, the house and both journal uh, of him, uh, uh, so something like the house and your journal uh, <laughs> you have published, and he has also published in the Journal of Labor, Labor Economics, Experimental Economics, and uh, Information Systems Research, and today he will talk about the frontiers and crowdsourcing labor market information. We are very much looking forward to your presentation. And without further ado, the floor is yours. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. That was a very kind introduction. Uh, and now I'm going to switch to German. No, I, I, I know how to order food. That's about the limit of, of where I can go. Um, but I, I am really excited to talk, talk to you all about uh, some things. I you know, chose this title. And then as I kind of worked on it, I realized that this wasn't exactly accurate. So the new title is an opinionated tour through some of my research with a discussion of research I'd like to see done. So that's that's the, the, the new working title. Uh, let me just kind of frame things up a bit by starting with like, what, what do we actually want out of labor markets? Um, there's a lot of answers to this question, uh, but I'm gonna kind of go with a, a, a sort of a narrow economist pinched view that what we really care about is we want the output that, that labor produces. We want the goods and services. We want the haircuts and the widgets and the restaurant meals and all the things that we're kind of like hoping to get uh, rides uh, in a taxi, things like that. And, um, but, you know, even, even a, a, a kind of a cold hearted economist who's just sort of thinking this in terms of the, the output that's produced. Um, we don't want to purely maximize output. We don't want everyone to just sort of work as hard as they can all the time to produce as much stuff as they can. Uh, if you're a social planner, you'd, you'd like the right amount of human capital. You'd like people to get uh, as much education such that the marginal benefit equals the marginal cost. Uh, we want people to work the right number of hours, right? Like we want people to make the right labor, labor leisure trade off so that that last hour that they work, whatever the, they're producing, um, is, is about equal to how much they would value having that time for their family, their, their hobbies, what, whatnot. Um, and we'd also like to have the best possible matching of workers to jobs and jobs to workers. So we want people kind of at jobs that it's really their, their comparative advantage that this is the best thing for them. And on the, the employer side, we'd like them to have the best worker that they can get, you know, subject to the constraint that. Um, people only have so much time and there's only so many things that they can do in, in some amount of time. Uh, and we want, we'd like, you know, the optimal amount of search to get us there. Like we don't, we don't presume that th these matches can happen right away. We, it's going to take some, some effort. Um, you know, and, and I would say that it, in economics, at least uh, these, these notions are fairly well formalized. Like you could take a intro labor economics class and it would talk about the labor leisure trade-off and derive a labor supply curve. And Gary Becker has been talking about optimal human capital and people making the right investments in their skills for, for a very long time. Um, and even this, this question of matching people, workers to jobs uh, is, 
is, I wouldn't say it's well studied, but it's, it's well formalized at least. People have said, you know, you can think of this as a max flow problem where you're matching applicants to jobs. Every, every edge you draw here has some payoff and you'd like to, what's the, what's the best one you can draw subject to the constraint that everyone kind of can only match to one job. Um, and, and, you know, some of these ideas have been put into practice. So Al Roth and his work on the medical residency match, they've used deferred acceptance where you elicit people's preferences and have them, um, you know, come up with the best match that you can subject to the constraint that, you know, no one wants to, no one wants to like unilaterally uh, switch. Um, and, you know, the idea that there's, there's search frictions in markets and that you have to overcome them and you can kind of do the best match you can subject to these search frictions. You know, this is kind of the heart of uh, modern macro labor. You could take a, a labor grad sequence and talk a ton about matching and search and unemployment. Okay, so, um, you know, if this is all well understood in theory, can we just figure out what's optimal and, and implement that plan? Um, well, you know, of, of course not. <laughs> um, us making the decisions about best and right and optical, uh, optimal doesn't really work out that well in practice, right? Hayek kind of a long time ago said, you know, the, the best laid plans of social planners are going to run into the fact that you don't have the information you might necessarily need uh, to, to make these decisions. So you don't really want someone saying this is the job for you necessarily, or this is the this is going to be your college major, uh, given what we know about you, or this is how many hours you're going to work. Um, you know, that's not really the realm that we want to to operate in, right, for, for, for I think a lot of good reasons. Um, so, you know, that, that creates, creates this question. So if you want to improve labor markets, if you want to lead to better, to better outcomes, because ultimately this affects how much can be produced, but I mean, also taking from the worker's perspective, um, if people are doing things that are a good fit for them and they're right, making the right decisions about how much to work, they're right, making the right decisions about their human capital, uh, they can lead better lives. Um, you can, you can, you know, the, the amount that you work can, can kind of get you more money or you could be more satisfied. And so I think I've always kind of had a, um, a little bit, I think, which is different from maybe the typical economist, but had, had kind of a design hat on a lot of times. Like what, what can we actually do to make markets better, fairer, more efficient? Um, and, you know, I think if, if you think about it as, as a planner or a, a government or someone who runs a platform, you know, you kind of have a couple of tricks. You can subsidize things and tax things to hopefully correct uh, negative externalities or try to um, double down on positive externalities. You can try to create rules and policies that you think are, are just and you know, would promote efficiency. Um, but the last thing you can do, and this is something that people often can't do for themselves is try to create and distribute uh, more and better information so people can make better choices. So if we think about this, this planning problem that I was formulating earlier, you know, it's, it's hard to decide what's the right amount of hours to work if you don't actually know what you get paid. You know, so a kind of, kind of a frequent criticism of Uber is, you know, it's kind of uncertain how much you're going to make or, you know, you, it's hard to factor in depreciation or things like that. Um, and so you can't make the right choice if you don't have the right information. Or, um, you know, knowing uh, what job might be a good fit for you. Uh, people have to make decisions about the labor market, uh, what they're going to specialize in before they may maybe necessarily know what jobs are like and sort of what they're going to like doing long term. Um, and so, and I think this is also where researchers actually have, have something to say is, you know, through our research, we can create a better understanding of, of systems, things like labor markets and crowd markets. And we can study things that make people understand, say, where their shortcomings are and how we could fix them. Um, you can also pilot ideas and, and, and create options for, for platforms. So even if you're not working for a platform or you're not actually in the government, I think this is a place where research can, can make a difference. And so the rest of my talk, I'm really going to focus on this, this notion of trying to create and distribute more and better information uh, as, as kind of a, a, a real task that we, we as researchers, or if you're, you're running a platform, can actually focus on and sort of do something about. So let me start with the first example, uh, which is, can we help job seekers by reducing search frictions? So some markets take these search frictions as a given, like this is just 
how the world works and you have to deal with the fact that you know you might bump into a job like a like a billiard ball and hopefully it's a good fit um you know real job search hopefully is a bit more directed than that but the question is you know what can we do to actually help um and you know th there's there's a lot of uh, you know, reason to think you can help. There's a lot of jobs out there and a lot of people out there at any one time. And sort of finding the one that's a good fit for you is uh, potentially a hard problem. You know, maybe even worse than finding a, a needle in a, in a haystack. Um, now, just this clip art I have of someone searching for a job, I don't think people still do this, like circle the classifieds. But, you know, just because you're on monster.com or Indeed or Simply Hired or, you know, whatever the equivalent is, it doesn't mean it's, it's that it's now easier. And, and if anything, in a world of remote work where it's going to matter less and less where you are, it, the, the search problem becomes harder. Like imagine now you could potentially work for, for any firm in the world. What's a good fit for you? Um, now, I, you know, I should say like in some markets, this matching can be centralized. So if you think of like Uber, or Lyft, and Diddy, um, you know, they know approximately the best car to match you with. So this is, this is, this is fine, like centralizing matching makes sense, but you know the vast majority of these matching markets, they're real, they really have this choose and be chosen character that centralized matching is a non-starter. You need to expose options to people and then they have to make decisions about which task or which job they'd like to pursue. Um, so you know, how do you actually help marketplace matching? Well, you know, one thing that I, I kind of, and, and this kind of harkens back to my Odesk experiences, I mean, one of the first things that online platforms can do or have to do is just structure the enormous amount of information that they, they collect. And so one of the, the first things I did at, at Odesk, I started working on helping people, um, you know, I wanted, most of matching happens there by skills. So people post a job, they say they want these skills and uh, job seekers see, okay, you want that skill. This is a good fit for me, I apply. And so they had a database that, had all this information, including a table called skills. And I said, oh, this is perfect. I'm just going to dig into this and find out what, um, you know, what's going on. And I remember it had over 100,000 entries for skills. And I thought, wow, this is, you know, this is really long tail. They must be capturing everything in the world that, that anyone could possibly do. And then I started digging into it. And what it was is it was just filled with synonyms. Um, I, I, you know, there was just tons of ways that people were writing Microsoft PowerPoint, um, you know, MS PowerPoint, Microsoft PowerPoint, PowerPoint, um, and then sk skills like world's best PowerPoint person, you know, like that. They, they, these weren't um, these weren't like distinct skills, and so I, I had a, like a several weeks long project of trying to like clean this up and make it it searchable. Yeah, this was a while ago. Um, since then, you'll find like any marketplace that has a matching problem like this that's of any size, they end up hiring taxonomists or people with like a library science background um, to, to try to like put things in the right categories and come up with controlled vocabularies. Uh, just as a, as before you even kind of do recommendations or anything else, just giving people ways to search. I mean, this isn't like maybe that academically interesting, but I think it's, it's, it's an interesting point. Just the first part of helping matching is, is trying to organize information into a way that can make it make it useful. Um, and so, you know, can you then, if so say you've collected this information, can you just give people to, tools to search and filter information about the jobs themselves? You know, and this is what, what platforms do. You know, they, you know, if you can go onto a site and start searching your keywords, and you'll start to see job listings coming up. Um, and, you know, I think I, I've been interested in this question for a long time, like how do people search and find jobs? In the conventional world, you know, we don't get to, Conventional labor markets, you don't get to see people circling those jobs in the classifieds, right? This was all kind of happening in the privacy of their home. In these online markets, you actually get to see people, how they, how they search, like literally how they're going and finding the jobs to work on. Um, and I worked with uh, some, some colleagues, uh, other, you know, they're mostly grad students in computer science. We scraped Mechanical Turk just to see sort of how quickly uh, hits or disappearing. So hits is the mechanical Turk word for a task. Um, and then we, we, what we could do is we could look and see how they were, how quickly they were disappearing based on which search filters the person was applying. So were they, as mechanical Turk gave you, you could search by newest, you could search by highest price, you could search by all these different factors. Um, 
what we found is that uh, it, it doesn't actually, the, their search actually didn't work that, that well. Um, most, most Mechanical Turk workers were just searching by the newest, like what was the most recently posted job. They were kind of like monitoring the flow of, of tasks being posted. Um, but then what, what had happened was that um, people, the requesters, the employers, the people trying to get work done, they knew that this was how what Mechanical Turk workers did. So what they would do is programmatically put their task onto the market and then programmatically take it down a few seconds later. And then Amazon would record that as a new task and put them, bump them to the top of search so they would be seen. Um, now, you, you know, one employer could do this and then multiple employers could do this. And so the, the plot here is just showing a couple tasks over time, what their position was. And you could see they're kind of like bouncing back and forth into the top, top position. They're essentially like competing with each other for these top positions. I mean, it, this is like an absurd way for, to find work, right? Like there's people competing to trick how your search works um, to try to get you to do their, to their tasks. If that wasn't bad enough, you know, almost no one was searching by price, which, you know, from an economist should like make you shed, shed a tear. Like why, you know, you'd want people to be going after sort of the highest price jobs first, clear the market that way. The, the truth is that on Mechanical Turk, the price was totally unrelated to what the actual price was because it would just say, okay, this is a dollar, or this is 10 cents, or this is 15 cents, but it wouldn't tell you how long it would take because you had to go find this out. And that, I mean, that makes all the difference in the world. If it's a dollar for a task that, ten, that only takes 10 seconds, you know, you're making more than $300 an hour. If it takes you an hour, it's a, it's a terrible wage. Um, so you really, you need to know how long a task would take to create a meaningful wage, but that's not possible. And so what Mechanical Turk workers were doing was sort of the best they could, given the, given the problem. Look at the new ones, try to find out if they're a good deal or not, and then continue on. So, uh, and oh, I, I, so you notice my background slide color switches to green. And so what I did was, if it's a task where I think that there's like more research needed or just questions that I have, I put it on a green slide to just flag it, make it a little more visually. I want to help you search. So, um, you know, I, I think that there's this kind of open question about what's the right way to actually present flows of, of opportunities, you know, be it jobs or tasks. Um, you know, the, the kind of status quo in a lot of places is just recency. Uh, but I, I don't know if that's the best, right? There's, there's reason, like, because if say someone, something kind of misses the first look by job seekers and then it gets push, pushed down, you know, potentially it's never seen. Um, the me Mechanical Turk example, it, it's kind of absurd, right? Like you, you, that, that it works so poorly. Maybe you could imagine a market where people can search by price and it actually means something. And, you know, that, that, tasks would sort of disappear at the right, right point, or people would kind of go after the best jobs first. Um, but it, I think it's kind of a question, like how, how should you actually do this in a way that, that makes sense? You know, a partial approach, uh, and this is a, another paper of mine, uh, you're gonna see, see a few of these, is uh, an experiment we, we ran with Facebook jobs. So Facebook has this jobs platform and we, we work with them to, uh, label some jobs with some congestion information. So basically tell them like, look, this job already has a ton of applicants or hey, this job doesn't have many applicants. Um, you know, the competition might be a little bit thinner. And that, you know, this is something that job seekers really can't do themselves. Like they have, they really have no idea how, how congested a job is. And in the paper, you know, we show that just, just putting a little bit of, um, just a little visual cue that this job is either under or oversubscribed actually helps job seekers uh, sort to jobs where the competition was a little bit thinner. Um, it wasn't a, an enormous effect, but I think it's an example of something that's not that costly for the platform to do, but maybe helps people get to a slightly better matching outcome for themselves. Well, you know, another, another tack for this problem, and you see it in a lot of online platforms, you know, rather than just giving people ways to search, what about doing algorithmic recommendations instead? So, you know, you tell me who you are, and then I'll, I'll give you jobs that I think would be a good fit for you. Or you tell me what you're looking for, and I'll give you workers who I think would be a good fit for you. Um, and you know, this, this approach works really well in e-commerce settings, 
Um, you know, Amazon is pretty tight lipped, but I think, you know, the how heavily they emphasize their recommendations suggests it probably works really well. Um, you know, telling people, you know, given how you've thought about these other things, you know, these are likely to be things that, that you might be interested in. Um, and so, you know, one of the first papers I wrote uh, with, you know, in a big online labor market, uh, this was actually with ODES, was to actually make recommendations to employers about who they should um, recruit. And it's really important. This is not who to hire, but just given that you have a, a job and you've described what it is, who might be a good fit, right? So where's that needle um, in the haystack? And you know, this was actually not a very sophisticated intervention. Like the algorithm was was like frankly pretty pretty plain vanilla, not not that complicated. Um, but it actually worked really well. Like it it, it the probability that the employer made a hire at all uh, went up substantially. And um, and so you know th this is I think uh, a promising case where you know just adding a little bit of information that taking advantage of the fact that the platform has this bird's eye view of the market, um, you can make potentially make more matches. Now, I can't really say if they were better matches, that, that was hard, but uh, it definitely made more matches. Um, that being said, um, I think I'm a little bit sour actually on, on this algorithmic approach. And, and, I, and you know, I think it's for, for a reason that has gotten a lot of attention in, in recent years, which is that you know, as you start to try to incomplete, increase the complexity of what you're doing algorithmically, so you're you know training on historical data and trying to make recommendations on the base of that. Um, you know, I think there's a large risk of introducing bias and in, in fairness uh, con considerations that you know you may be doing things that are just reproducing um, biases that people already had that showed up in your training data. And now you're kind of putting an algorithmic um, stamp of approval on them. And so I think that when, you know, and, and as you try to kind of go with more and more complex approaches, I think the risk of this in increases. Um, I, I think that they can still have their place, but I think it's worth flagging this, this kind of very real concern. Um, so let me give, you know, an, an alternative would be like, you know, could we actually have human market helpers that assist with searching and matching? And maybe avoid some of these algorithmic approaches. And you know, if you if you're an economic sociologist, you know, you're probably very familiar with Granovetter and the, the, this point that most people find their jobs through their social networks. That that that's actually uh, you know, and that it's these weak ties that kind of alert you to, to opportunities that really make a big difference. Is it is it possible to formalize that and and kind of use uh, you know human helpers to find people to, to match? And you know, you can kind of think of this as a Kind of wisdom of crowds type way of thinking about things, which I just want to, you know, <laughs> as as a speaker, I guess it's it's my my prerogative to kind of pull from my back catalog of papers and try to you know maybe try to get you to cite them in the current day. But you know, one of the very first things I did in, in grad school was, uh, you know, when I first started running experiments on Mechanical Turk, was ran um, guessing games. So if you're kind of familiar with where this wisdom of crowds idea comes from. One of the first applications was, uh, it was like a fair in England and they had people guess the weight of an ox. And the observer, and like the, whoever was closest would, would win the meat from the ox. And what, what, you, what they found was that actually everyone is pretty far off, but they're kind of like off some plus or minus from the, the true weight. And that if you actually took the mean or the, the median, you'd actually be quite close. And so, you know, I was really intrigued with, by this idea. And so on, on Mechanical Turk, I would give people these images with dots. You can see one in the upper left-hand corner. And I'd ask them to guess how many dots there were. And I would only give them a short amount of time. Um, and I would vary how many dots. So that the, the other figure is just showing like how many dots were, there were. And the distribution shows where the guesses were. And, you know, you can replicate this wisdom of crowds thing like super easily. Like people, people are you know, collectively very good, individually not, not so great. So I think this idea that if you kind of had an open call or like asked like, hey, I'm looking for a job and get, get a bunch of recommendations or, um, you know, have people kind of weigh in which job would be the, the best for someone, you know, maybe you could, you could do, do pretty well. Um, I don't know though. Um, and so, you know, so now here's another green slide. Um, 
does wisdom of crowds work for job recommendations and assistance? Like, is there is there a potential for doing crowdsourced matching assistance in a in a market? Um, I you know I don't know how popular this company is, you know, more broadly, but Stitch Fix, which is this, you, they like help you pick out clothes and then send you a box of clothes. Uh, you know, they use human stylists to help match people to clothes. Essentially, like they kind of learn about your taste and then they say, okay, you know, this would be the the right thing for you. Um, you know, I mean, and obviously like the recruiting industry exists. We know that there are people who do this now, um, but I kind of wonder, are there like scalable ways to rely on that wisdom of crowds, brand of better, weak, strength of weak ties type ideas um, to, to work better in, in, in matching markets? And, you know, I think crowd markets or online markets are a great place to try these ideas out because you can actually uh, build things, run experiments, measure them to a in a way that in a conventional market is, is pretty, pretty challenging still. Um, okay, but let, you know, I kind of sour some, throw some more cold water on these uh, recommendation assistant approaches that just goes beyond even concerns about bias and fairness and whether or not people can do them. Um, there's a real concern in, in any time you're making recommendations like this in a market that, um, you're, you're just sort of crowding things out. And what I mean by that is like, if I recommend job A to a worker uh, instead of job B and job B now goes unfilled, I, I, you know, I, I potentially end up double counting the, you know, I, I want to take credit for filling the A job, but I also caused the B job to, to go unfilled. Now, maybe the A job was, was, is better. Like it, and you know, it's like marginally better for them to go with A than with B, but we're we're kind of overcounting the gains we get if we're just kind of shuffling around who goes to what job. Um, you know, if I recommend worker C, you know, when worker D otherwise would have been hired, what have I really done? Again, maybe I created a better match, uh, but you know, I'm kind of maybe just moving around who gets what. And, you know, and I think in like e-commerce settings, we don't really, we don't really worry so much about this. You know, so when Amazon recommends toaster A over toaster B, you kind of say, well, whatever, who cares? Uh, I think in a, in a labor market, this is, this is I, I think, a little bit more consequential. You're talking about people's livelihoods. Um, and there's a, a, a real question, like, what, what are you actually accomplishing? Um, and I think that there's a paper that I, is well known, but I think should be even more well known. So uh, there was an experiment run in France where they gave job seeking assistants, so people who were unemployed, helping them help, helping them find jobs. Um, and the unique design, they ran this in a whole bunch of French cities, and kind of varied how much, how many people were kind of getting the, this treatment. And what what was interesting is it, is it did help those who were treated were more likely to find jobs. Uh, but the paper concludes that one, the effects maybe weren't that long lasting. But I think even, even more damaging, a lot of the benefit just came from the expense of the people who didn't get the assistance. So it, it, it was a little ephemeral, right? Like you, you didn't actually increase the number of jobs that were getting filled. You just sort of shifted around um, who was getting, getting hired. Uh, and I, I've actually found similar effects in, in the experiments that I've run, uh, that you can move around who gets hired pretty easily, but not necessarily increasing the, the total number of hires. So one that I ran a, a few years ago, uh, what the platform did was if they, they scored all the workers who had applied on a score from zero to one, how, you know, how good of a, a fit they thought they would be. And then what they did is if they were above a threshold, 0.5, um, the platform would guarantee that, that work so that the, the worker was, was essentially, if, they, if the client wasn't happy, they would give the money back the platform would give the money back. And you can see in the, the upper corner here, uh, I plotted the average probability that someone was hired for the treatment and the control. Oh, and the, the important thing here is, um, so the treatment had this guarantee thing going on and the control did not. So in the control, there was, they, they weren't doing this. So you can see that these two lines kind of move together, that if you had a better score, you were more likely to get hired, which is not too surprising. Um, if you were in the cell where you were guaranteed, you can see that it's like, you know, considerably above the control, meaning that employers 
if you were guaranteed, they were more likely to hire you. And you can actually see below the threshold, it's actually reversed, which is also what you would expect that, um, you know, you're, you're basically pulling, you're essentially like pulling some people uh, from, from the other, other side. But, okay, so this worked in the sense that if you were guaranteed by the platform, you were more likely to be hired. But if you look at the other table I have there, the outcome is just whether or not the employer who was, was treated was more likely to fill their job at all. And it's essentially a precisely estimated zero. So, you know, all this did was just change around who got hired um, without actually increasing the total number of hires. So, you know, not, not, a, not, a great, not a great outcome. So, you know, I think what, um, you know, to, to kind, of kind of give, this is a big green slide. So what I, what I really would be neat, and I think is, is kind of badly missing, is a book that's something called like Algorithms for Labor Markets. And there's a, there's a few pieces of this, like it, partially I'm kind of rolling up this point about what, what should determine what gets shown at one time, like what should be in someone's feed of, of jobs, um, which workers should people be exposed uh, uh, to. Um, the other thing is just, if you think about like the, the kind of classic collaborative filtering approach, it kind of works on um, like, uh, I like a whole bunch of movies and I, I haven't rated other movies yet. I've rated a bunch, I've rated some movies, but I haven't rated others. And you're going to use the fact that you have lots of users who have, there's some overlap in sort of what movies we've rated. And we're going to like make an inference about how you'd feel about this other movie that you actually haven't rated yet. But, or we, we can kind of find people who are similar to you and, you know, just kind of assume that birds of a feather flock together and we'll like sort of show you things that, um, you know, other people who are like you seem to value. Um, but, you know, he, I mean, here's the, the problem. Jobs aren't like that, right? Like there's not, you know, um, like we all haven't had the same job, right? Like we, it's, it's like a single worker, typically a single, a single job post. And so that, that collaborative filtering logic is not quite there, right? You can't, you can't quite do the same thing. Um, I mean, I have ideas on how you might do something similar. You know, you'd have to like maybe cluster jobs together first and figure out what, which are similar and then, then maybe try to do this or, you know, use applications as, as signals of interest. But I, I think that there's an opportunity to try to take the standard collaborative filtering recommender system paradigm and see if you can apply it to, to jobs. What makes it more complicated is you'd really want things to be sort of congestion aware, right? Like you don't want to recommend, you know, if you think about like recommending books to kids or something, you know, you might say like, oh, read Harry Potter. Everyone loves Harry Potter. You know, all you kids should read Harry Potter. You can't say if there's a job like, oh, hire this one guy. He's amazing. All million of you should hire this person or like, oh, here's the great job for you. All million of you should apply. It, it just doesn't make any sense, right? So you, you, you want recommendations that are somehow not over-recommending um, anything. Like it should, be, it should be balanced in some way. And then, you know, and, and I think this is kind of another way of saying, like, how do you account for these crowd out problems, right? Does it make sense to, um, you know, pour more applications into a particular job when all it's going to do is just sort of shift around who gets, gets hired. Um, and, and I think another thing that just I'm kind of, kind of keep compounding, like why this is, this is challenging. Um, you know, does it even make sense, say, in a labor context or in an e-commerce context to say who the best person is to hire, um, especially when wages can adjust? So a person might be you know, better at the job, but if they're charging a lot more money, um, you know, maybe they're not a good fit. Someone may not be as experienced or good, but they're kind of proposing a lower price. Maybe that's the, the person to go for. So I think there's a lot of like interesting questions about th that are that are still I think quite open, at least in my mind. Okay, so let's let's add another complication. Um, the platform doesn't necessarily have the information needed to make good recommendations. So you know even if you had a brilliant approach for making a job feed or algorithmic recommendations, you may not have, have exactly what you, you need. So, um, and I'll give you an example from, from my work that um, has kind of bothered me for a really long time. Um, so if you're a firm and you're recruiting, like you're trying to hire people, uh, you want to know who's actually interested 
in the job. You don't want to spend a lot of time trying to recruit people who are totally happy and aren't, aren't going to move. Um, now, some workers will tell you because you'll post a job and they'll apply. And so you, you kind of know that they're interested. But a lot of recruiting happens with people who aren't you know, on the market, right? They're already employed. And you know, you're trying to, the firm is trying to suss out whether or not they'd be willing to, to move. The, the freelancer version of this uh, is, is a paper I, I wrote uh, several years ago, which was just the, the, the problem um, is that employers are trying to hire freelancers. So they say, hey, this might be a good job for you. Uh, but the freelancers turn them down and say, sorry, I'm not, I'm not available. Uh, so that's not, not great. But the problem is if you just ask the freelancers, do you have the capacity to take on more work? Are you actually available? Almost all of them will say yes. So what's going on is that um, job offers are useful, right? Like even if you don't take them, getting an outside offer, getting a job offer, it may, you know, maybe, maybe it's the dream job that you've been waiting for. So you have very little incentive to kind of tell people like, hey, I'm not, I'm not on the market. And so you have this problem of people we're trying to match with workers who aren't, aren't actually interested in taking on more work, and they don't have much of an incentive to tell you the truth. Like they might, you know, to the point where your job offers are something like spam, maybe they would be willing to say no. Uh, but, you know, I think a social planner would want you to say no a lot, a lot earlier than that, but that, it, you know, you're, you're kind of wasting job offers that could go to someone who really valued them. Um, and so the, this, this paper really just documents the problem. It sort of shows that if you try to recruit someone and they give you a no, um, you're much less likely to fill your job. Now, you, you, know, you might be worried that the kind of people who say you know, jobs that get turned down kind of are terrible to begin with, but the paper is, is kind of a very long attempt to deal with that endogeneity issue and, and come up with a credible way of saying what is the actual causal effect of getting a rejection. And, you know, the answer is like, it's pretty large. Like it, it's bad if you try to recruit people and then you're unsuccessful, you're much less likely to get your job uh, ultimately filled. So, you know, I think a, a, in a lot of these matching markets, there is this, this problem of surfacing seller capacity and interest is is really first order. I mean, you know, Airbnb has a version of this problem. Like, is this is this house actually available? Um, especially if people are like multi-homing on lots of platforms, knowing that they actually have a capacity can be can be pretty tricky. In the conventional market, LinkedIn has actually done something pretty interesting, where you can have this little open to work badge that appears uh, on you. And he, what's interesting here is that. People are kind of reluctant to put it on. It's almost the opposite of the problem I described where everyone will say they're open all the time. In the LinkedIn context, it's typically not a great idea to tell your current employer that you're thinking about you know, looking for, for new work. And so they have this little thing where you can turn it on, but it's actually secret. Like only people who have a recruiter account can, can see it. Um, I actually turn mine on because I'm curious about how this works. Uh, I don't, I don't think MIT thinks I'm actually you know, lo like looking to jump, but um, it, it's, it's a little bit different from the context I, I described, but I do think that this is a, like a real problem in a lot of marketplaces of getting people to expose this information credibly. And I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a solved problem. Well, okay. So what about rather than just, uh, say, relying on information that already exists, uh, can you find ways to inject more information? And I guess the, you know, the badge is kind of an example of this, but you know, just more generally, like, can you find ways to get more information into the market? Um, and so I want to talk, this is a, an experiment that I ran that ran it a long time ago, and we just kind of created a working paper very recently uh, because it kind of just took us a long time to figure out how to think about what we were doing. And what it was is uh, an experiment run in a large online labor market where people are doing, doing tasks. And what started it was just this notion that some employers were looking for really, really experienced, uh, high, like extremely high quality people to do something like high quality workers or very experienced workers, and were willing to pay a high price for it. And others, you know, they may have a job that they kind of described in a similar way, but they actually were fine with someone who's at the very start of their career or is kind of uh, you know, a beginner or a novice uh, if, the, if the price was, was low enough. And this element of 
difference was not necessarily easy for job seekers to, to suss out, right? Like just looking at a job description, you wouldn't really know if someone says, build me a website, are you looking for like the top end best website builder you can find? Or, you know, are you okay with someone who's, you know, maybe just getting started and it's going to be a little rough around the edges. So what we did was we ran an experiment where we asked employers who are posting jobs to tell us low, medium, and high. Like, are you entry level, intermediate, or are you looking for a real expert? And you can see the little dollar signs, uh, you know, which is kind of like a common convention for restaurant menus of like how, you know, or restaurant reviews, like, is this expensive or, or not expensive? But what we did critically here is we collected this information, but then we randomized whether or not the job seekers could actually see it. Right. So, and the employers wouldn't know this. So, some people's jobs had these labels, other people's jobs did not at random. And so, what this allowed us to do is even in the control group where this was not shown, we could sort of see how much sorting happened anyway. Uh, like, how were they already getting people who were about what they were looking for? But then we could also see like how much the signal actually helped to enhance the sorting with the notion that it's just good to get more applicants of the kind that you're, you're looking for. We had this worry that um, employers wouldn't want to do this because one of the dangers of saying expert is that maybe you get the same people you would have otherwise, uh, but they just bid up against you. And then you know, they're like, okay, Mr. Moneybags, you know, I'll, I'll do your job and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, bid like 20 or 30% higher. Uh, so that was a concern. So this is why we ran the experiment. And it turns out that we, there was a fair amount of sorting to begin with. So what this is just showing is where people's wages were. Um, the, uh, like what, this is like the, the applicant's prior earnings, so a proxy for their experience. And the three things are in order, high, medium, and low. So employers that said high, medium, and low. And then there's the shown preference is equal to zero on the x-axis. These are people who didn't have their preferences revealed. And then the other value shown preference equals one is people who had it revealed. And what you, know, what you can see is there's a lot of sorting already. People are already kind of sorting to the right job, but then revealing the signal led to a lot more sorting. So people who had their, their preferences revealed ended up hiring people who were like um, almost like 20, 20, close to 25% less experienced. So this was, this was helpful for especially new job seekers to find the kind of employers that were interested. I don't have a slide on it, but we also, it also did cause bidding up. So when people saw that it was an, the kind of employer that was paying high wages, they actually did say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, charge you a premium. And we don't, think, we don't think it was because the work was any harder. We think they just kind of realized that they had a little bit of market power and um, exploited it. So you know, I, I think a question, you know, so this is just one dimension of a job. Um, are there other attributes of jobs that this kind of design pattern works for? Is it like maybe if a job is urgent, you could have a toggle, yes or no. Um, the kind of attributes you're looking for, uh, like you know, what kind of seller attributes? Like, do they have to be, you know, um, really punctual, ef efficient, or good people skills? And they only get to pick one. You know, so you have to force a trade-off of some kind. Um, you know, maybe something about the likelihood of the filling of the job. I mean, the important thing is it has to be something where there's a trade-off, right? You don't want something where like. The question can't be like, are you a good person as an employer? Like everyone's going to just select yes. There has to be something that reveals some information that helps people uh, kind of distinguish between different jobs and then sort to the job that's a good fit for them. Um, so then, you know, another kind of information is just what are you good, right? Are you, are you a, a, a worker who kind of creates good outcomes? And, you know, are you going to be a good fit for what the employer is looking for? And you know, in, in a lot of markets, online markets, not just labor markets, this reputation plays a critical role. So you know, reputation used to be just you know, what people thought of you. It wasn't like reified and turned into a numerical score. Um, but now it's very common to have reputation systems kind of disciplining people in these markets, you know, Uber and Lyft and Airbnb, et cetera. You know, people have these scores, which are just, just the aggregated ratings from, from past trading partners. Uh, they're ubiquitous, like they're, they're extremely common. Um, I have a paper with Joe Golden and, uh, and Apostolos uh, that looks at like what happens to these things 
over time. And you know, what, what we show is that in, in one market, and then we actually have a bunch of evidence from other markets that it's incredibly skewed, that almost everyone is getting a perfect rating, uh, even though it's probably not the case that everyone is perfectly happy. And that also this is like evolves over time, that it's not just that on day one, everyone had perfect reputations, that it starts out kind of, here was a five-star system, everything was about three stars. And then every over time, it just kind of keeps inching up and inching up and inching up that you get this like extremely skewed distribution where almost everything is, is perfect. Um, you know, and you, well, you might, you might say, well, well, maybe everything's just getting really awesome and everyone's super happy and that's why it's so, so skewed. Uh, we don't think so. Uh, we actually took like the text of the reviews and pulled out phrases from the, so people leave numerical reviews and they also leave a text review. We just compared it two points in time, um, phrases like good job, highly recommended, thank you, would hire again. Uh, and, and, and also negative things like terrible, unresponsive, would not hire again. In all of these cases, the associated star rating is now higher, even though it's the exact same phrase, right? So a person who was saying terrible back in 2008 was giving like 1.5 stars. And you know now they're giving 2.5 stars. I mean, that's still a bad review, but you can see this kind of um, uh, what we call reputation inflation, where the, the same work is kind of garnering uh, a higher score than it would have in the past. And we think we have some evidence that people are just sort of being strategic about how they report. So we asked this question, the platform asked this question when it was eliciting reviews, you know, would if just, and they, they, they really flagged, this was totally private. Would you work with this freelancer again, worker again, if you had a similar project? And you can answer definitely no, probably no, probably yes, definitely yes. Uh, and then I've plotted here the distribution of the actual scores that people give. And so what you'll see is people who say definitely yes, like they, they really liked working with this person, they almost overwhelmingly give perfect feedback, you know, five stars, which is what you would kind of expect, right? But look at the, the top one, definitely not. So these are people who are saying like, I would not work with this person again. This was not a good experience. One star is the most common, but the second most common is five stars. Right? Like people, they said like, I had a terrible private experience, but publicly I'm going to say, good job, five stars. So, you know, what we think is going on is um, people in a nutshell don't like to say bad things to people. Like they don't, they don't want to say that was really not good work. Um, you know, there's a reason, there's, a, you know, an expression in English, don't shoot the messenger. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a similar expression in, in German and, and a bunch of other languages. Like giving bad news is a little, is a little risky. And so you don't get much of it. And then you can kind of see how the, the dynamics happen where, if people are kind of withholding their bad feedback, the average feedback rises, and then sort of what gets considered bad kind of keeps kind of shifting down. And eventually, you know, this can only stop with everything sort of being pooled at the very, very highest point. Um, you know, in interest of time, I'm going to skip, skip this one. But, you know, it, well, I'll say just really quickly, we actually kind of decompose how much we think is attributable to inflation versus actual quality improvements in the platform. And you know, most of the average score increase is coming from what we think is, is just reputation inflation. Um, so th this pattern is really common in a lot of marketplaces. Basically, anyone where we could get some data, um, you can see it. But, and, 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 not, and interestingly enough, not in like markets for product reviews, like things like where people are rating uh, restaurants or, or rating goods on, on Amazon, it really seems to be this one where it's like a human is delivering the service to you, like in a labor market, uh, it, it, it happens. So the question is, you know, a, well, a couple of research questions, is this bad? That we kind of think that it is in the sense that it probably people can't kind of tell who's, who's good or bad anymore. Um, I think there's an open question of like, can you actually design systems that aren't quite so prone to inflation? Um, and if raters don't want to harm sellers with bad feedback, if that's really what's going on, but, but bad feedback is, is essential, uh, what, what can the platform do about it? Create alternative systems, um, something else. I think that there's just kind of this open question of if this doesn't work that well, what do you replace it with? Um, all right, so I want I to like change, change focus a little bit to something that's different. So everything I've talked about so far is like, how do you get more information into a market, or how do you create incentives for, for creating, getting more 
kind of information that's useful. Um, what about actually trying to change the distribution of earnings or wages? Uh, you, you know, not just kind of injecting more information, but maybe taking a strong stand on what people can, can get paid. And, you know, I think you think about crowd work or gig work or however you want to call it, um, you know, a lot of the um, policy dispute, public anger uh, has, has focused on the, the distribution of wages or benefits um, is maybe not very attractive, right? So, uh, you know, a lot of people have tried to estimate like what do Uber drivers really make when you take into a con uh, account um, depreciation and, and things like that. And, you know, answers vary, but some of the numbers you'd say like, boy, that, that doesn't seem like that could make economic sense. So maybe you want to try to impose a price floor or something like that. And, you know, just similar to, to places where, um, you know, there's like pretty strong labor standards, you know, having people who are working like below the minimum wage or having jobs that, you know, don't have, they're, they're effectively jobs, but don't have, have the benefits that you would associate with jobs or you're required to have job uh, required to have with those jobs or it's a real concern. Um, so, you know, I, I have two experiments that uh, I want to talk about that are trying to change um, prices, like change what people get by influencing the price in a, in a marketplace. I mean, you know, in both of these cases, these are things that the platform kind of has the power to do. It's a little bit less of, um, you know, something where you can kind of imagine people necessarily doing for them, themselves. Um, the first is uh, about a minimum wage that was imposed in a large online labor market. So this is taking a marketplace and uh, essentially saying that workers aren't allowed to work at a price below uh, something that's sort of set, right? Um, and it was done as an experiment. So employers were randomized at, their, at the level of their job post that they could only get a minimum, they could only get bids like below, oh, sorry, above $2 an hour, $3 an hour, $4 an hour. And they were randomized into it. And this the control got the status quo, which was there was no, uh, no minimum wage at all. And, you know, I mean, the, 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 this is not like a minimum wage that's imposed at the country level where all of a sudden now everyone in the country kind of has to follow this. It was done experimentally. That has both pros and cons. We can see a little bit more easily what it did. Um, and we can kind of kind of measure, uh, you know, yeah, how did employers react? Generalizing to a world where everyone is subject to the minimum wage is challenging. Um, but with the experiment, you can kind of sort of see, get a first look at what, what people do. And, you know, the first thing is that it really worked in the sense that it raised wages. So maybe that's not, not so surprising, but you could imagine that there are employers, if presented higher wages, um, you know, because of a minimum wage would just say, you know, to heck with it, I'm not going to hire at all. And that's not what happened. So we observe the wages that, that jobs, the contracts were formed at. And so you can see these are like two, three, and four dollars an hour. The outcome here is the log wage. Um, in the highest wage, wages were about 14% higher. So, uh, you know, a su substantial increase in the contracts being formed. Now, the concern with any minimum wage is what did you do? to the probability that someone was um, hired at all. So here we can actually look at this. There was some reduction in hiring. Um, it was about a 2% percentage point, two point, two percentage point reduction, which is about 4% given the, the, the number of jobs that, that fill. I mean, whether or not you think that that's a good trade-off, you know, kind of depends on how much value you put on some workers getting a bit more money and then some jobs not filling, but you know, maybe the jobs that weren't being filled you know, maybe weren't such great jobs to begin with. It's kind of all the kind of political economy discussion about minimum wages apply here as well. Like, do you think this is a good trade-off? The one thing that is not so great um, is that, you know, because this is a computer-mediated platform, I know a lot about the attributes of the hired worker. Like, what are their past wages? And what's their past experience? And what you can see is the workers that were hired, uh, and these like all admin and LPW stands for low predicted wage. These are just different groups of jobs that essentially partially how the employers reacted was just by hiring more experienced people. So, you know, if they know that they have to pay $4 an hour, they don't hire someone who's like a raw beginner. They hire someone with a bit more experience. And so 
this this labor labor substitution um, it's very very easy to see in the data is not so great like because you're you're kind of shifting around who gets hired you're not just kind of taking the same person and making sure they get get more wage you know a higher wage you're you're kind of altering the composition of who gets hired at, at the expense of kind of the least experienced people that may not be a trade off that that you want to make okay so let me give another example uh, this is a, this is not really a true experiment this is relying on some natural variation from um, some things that Uber did. So in the US, um, Uber has experimented with different fares for passengers, which uh, affects driver earnings or hourly earnings rates. So essentially how it, how it works, at least it, it worked, it's a little different now, but how it worked was that drivers take a percentage of the fares. So similar to most taxi markets are like this, you know, the passenger maybe pays $20, the, um, you know, and the driver, uh, you know, gets, gets some percentage of that. Or actually, in a, lot of, in a lot of places, the driver has a medallion that they have to rent, and then they, they get to keep all the money, but they have to buy the, the medallion. But on, on Uber and Lyft, it's, it's just a percentage, of the, um, a percentage of a trip. So, you know, if, if, you, if, if Uber takes and lowers the price of a trip, the driver mechanically makes less on that trip because it's just a, a, a lower percentage. What makes it a little complicated, though, in, in ride-sharing markets is that you only get paid while you're on trip. Um, so, you know, you may get, if you get paid a lot per trip, but you only have a small number of trips, like say you work an hour and you only, um, you know, you're only with a passenger for 10 minutes of that. Well, you know, you may prefer to get paid a lower amount per trip, but you have trips for 20 minutes of that hour or 30 minutes of that hour. So that's that's that that's the kind of trade-off. The the question that we kind of look at with this paper is when Uber has changed around prices, what does it do to driver earnings? Not immediately, because we know that we know immediately it, it changes the wage by sort of exactly as much as you, you've changed the um, uh, the price. What does it do to uh, wages going forward? So what we have is a, a panel of cities. In the United States that have Uber, and the the D here is when they went fares went down, and then U is when fares went up, and it, you know how much they kind of changed uh, varied. The the paper is is kind of a long discussion about why you can kind of treat these as as good as random, uh, or if it's they're not random, like ways you can kind of control for um, you know concerns you might have that like well. Maybe this is a city where drivers were already going to start making less money. So, you know, all these kind of like stories that that kind of plague um, non-experimental work. But you know, that's what the paper. If you really want to get into the details, that's what that's all about. Um, but I can just kind of show you at a high level what happened to driver earnings. So, if you imagine that um, like Uber increases the fare, like they increase what what passengers have to pay. Um, there's not much evidence of any pre-period trends in either like their earnings, um, their utilization, which is the fraction of an hour where they actually spend with passengers, or also surge, which, I, which is the way Uber takes in, um, you know, if there's, if there's a lot of demand and not much supply, they'll like add a multiplier to their baseline fare to, um, you know, to either get passengers to request fewer trips, but also to get drivers to provide more trips or to come back online. And that could be a way you could kind of counteract these changes in the base fare. Um, so what you see is when prices go up, surge goes down on average, which is, is kind of what you would expect, right? Like if, if the baseline price of Uber is a bit higher, Uber is going to use surge less to, to clear the market. Um, if you look at utilization, uh, this is kind of the really, you know, kind of the sharpest results here, that when Uber takes an charges more money to take a trip, the drivers end up spending a smaller amount of time actually with passengers, right? Because with higher prices, there's fewer passengers requesting trips. Um, and so, you know, the, the, from the driver's perspective, there's just, you know, fewer, fewer passengers out there requesting trips. But if you do get one, they're really valuable. So it makes more sense to be continue to drive, drive around without any passengers. Um, and so your utilization goes down. And so then the question is like, well, what's the net effect 
for the passenger, sorry, for the driver on their earnings, the answer is, is about a wash. Um, you can see like, so these are weeks following the, the fare change. You can see it initially pops up when Uber increases the price that they make more, more per hour of work uh, because the trips are, are, are more, but because when that utilization effect starts to kick in, um, you start to get this decline in their hourly earnings. Uh, and it goes back at the end, about eight weeks later, it's about where it started from. That's the, the kind of the big so what of the, the paper that doesn't, doesn't matter too much. I mean, there, there's other things that change as well. I could refer you to the paper, like one wait times actually change quite a bit. So the, the, the quality of the service changes with different prices. But from a driver perspective, um, it's, not, it's not a big, big difference. Um, so drivers went about making the same before. That being said, um, there's pretty strong evidence in the paper that drivers actually preferred the higher wage equilibrium. Like they actually preferred it. They preferred making more money, but driving a little bit less. Like they would rather have more money and a lower utilization, even though it was kind of a wash. And I, you know, I have some theories on that, that, you know, it's kind of a, it's a kind of a pain to have passengers. There's like greater costs from, from having to drive harder. You have to, you know, you're, you're, you're literally working harder. Um, and so, you know, drivers seem to, to prefer it, but it was not, not a slam dunk either. Like it wasn't, it didn't have big, big effects. So I think the, the request for research here is, you know, if you're trying to raise earnings in a labor market, and, you know, this is, this is where the kind of the narrow view of the economics of this kind of break down, like, like it's, it's not just about the goods and services, we also care about the people in the labor market. And, you know, we all else equal, we'd prefer that they, you know, make more money at what they're doing. And um, the, the question is, what are, you know, what are steps you can take for raising worker earnings without too many side, negative side effects. You know, so, you know, in, in the efforts from my work, you know, they, 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 there was some benefits. Uh, drivers seemed to be better off. You saw that wages rose for the minimum wage experiment, but, you know, there were, there were kind of costs that were, were offsetting where they were shifting towards more experienced workers in one case, um, and there was a decline in utilization in the other. The total number of passenger miles probably went down a bit with higher fares, and so you, you were getting less less of the goods that you're, you're kind of hoping for. So I, you know, I think th this is, I think a rich area to study is like, if you're trying to raise earnings in these markets, what are ways you can do it um, that, you know, don't have a ton of negative side effects that actually do make people better off and you know, ideally make, make consumers off and, and workers off though, you know, maybe that that's too much of a, that's a too much of a tall order. Um, so I, I'm, I know I'm, I'm early, but I want to kind of ha make sure we have enough time for, for questions too and discussion. Um, you know, I think, so I want to leave you with, with uh, two thoughts. Um, you know, one of the things I, I felt sometimes self-conscious about in working on online markets is that compared to the labor markets as a whole, uh, they're not that large. You know, like, I mean, when I, was, when I was starting with Mechanical Turk, I mean, you know, the best I could tell there was maybe like five or $6,000 worth of transaction volume happening through the market. Um, it, when I was starting at, um, at, at Odesk, it was already a very successful company, but you know, Americans spend something like two or $3 billion a year on Halloween candy. And you know, they weren't nearly as big as, as that, right? So it, they were kind of small. Now Uber and Lyft are you know, considerably larger, but even then um, they're not massive. Compared to like the labor market as a whole, where people are doing like trillions of dollars worth of, of, of work. So then, you, you know, the question is like, am I, what am I working on that does this, you know, is this just a curiosity or does this really matter? Um, I think they do matter because although they're relatively small now, I think of them as they're sort of a glimpse of a more computer mediated future. Like when, when the labor market especially with a switch to remote work is much more like these markets in the sense that you can, you can do things algorithmically. Um, you can create mechanisms to reveal new information. You can structure data. You can do, you can do searching um, that, that like just isn't possible in a conventional market. So I, I think that in some ways, like studying these now is a way to kind of get an early start on what more and more markets will be like in the, in the future. And so I think that, that that's, 
been one of the main reasons I've been, been kind of so keen to continue with this research program that they may be small, but they're important. Um, I think the other thing is, is that I, and my green slides are a testament to this. I think there's just like a lot of exciting research uh, to be done. I think we're kind of, to use a baseball metaphor, we're in the early innings or we're, it's just sort of starting out. These, these markets aren't that old. And um, I, I think we're still sort of seeing like what can be done. People are still kind of creating new marketplace businesses all the time. People are figuring out new ways of things to work. Entrepreneurs are kind of throwing ideas out there. So I think that that is a real opportunity for people who are researching and studying labor, marketplaces, crowd work, crowdsourcing to kind of continue to bring, you know, what, what we bring, which is you know, either connections to some social science discipline or insights, or maybe more sophisticated ways of working with data to kind of understand the world a bit better and make, make positive recommendations about how things um, could potentially be done. Um, so thank you for, for letting me uh, talk and, and kind of plug a lot of my own papers. Uh, but I kind of wanted to give you a, just a tour of sort of how I've, I've thought about these things now for you know, 10 plus years and sort of give you a sense of what, where I think the opportunities are. Um, and so, you know, I know.